Kasla, and I'm a project associate at Build a Green and will be facilitating this webinar along with our presenter, Tamara Larson of Link Housing and Seed Partners. Build a Green is presenting this webinar on behalf of the Energy Network, which is a local government organization created by the CPUC that provides resources and assistance to homeowners, businesses, and public agencies planning energy efficiency upgrades serving the Southern California region. These services include community education and outreach, such as these webinars, rebate and incentive offerings, attractive financing terms, and tools to help identify contractors that have been trained in energy efficiency. Additional resources help homeowners take the next steps towards saving energy. The Energy Network has a great platform for multifamily property owners, and we'll tell you a little bit more about that towards the end of our webinar. Today's presenter is Samara Larson. Samara is Director of Sustainability for Link Housing and Seed Partners, Link's mission-driven water and energy services company. Seed has specialized expertise in sustainable retrofits of multifamily housing. Ms. Larson and her SEED team provide a one-stop approach with services including assessment, design, financing options, and project and construction management. Prior to joining SEED Partners, Ms. Larson managed the Southern California Utility Programs for Enovity Inc., an energy consulting firm. She also spent more than 15 years at the University of California, Irvine, serving in various positions including Director of Strategic Planning and Assistant Director of Facilities Management. She holds an MBA from the University of California, Irvine's Paul Mirage School of Business and a bachelor's degree in architecture from California Polytechnic State University, San Luis Obispo. Ms. Larson is a registered architect in California and a LEED accredited professional. Please join me in welcoming Samara Larson. Well, thank you, Layla, and thank you for having me today. Um, I appreciate the Energy Network for hosting this webinar and inviting us to be here. And welcome to everybody who's on the call. Um, we appreciate you coming for this Energy Management and Multifamily Buildings webinar. That is a pretty big topic, so I thought we'd start at a high level and sort of work our way down into some of the details. We know that there's a lot of challenges for developers and owners in the multifamily market. And regardless of the fact that some people might like to tell you that green is the new black, um, the reality is it's not easy being green. It takes thought, it takes planning, and most of the time it takes investment. Like most things, it takes money to do this. And so with all the things that are looking for your time and money these days, why should this get your attention? Clearly something about it. are also more cost effective in the long run to operate. Here in California, green is becoming less of an option and more of a minimum standard. Unless you've been away from building in the last year or so, you've seen the impact of the latest code changes. Overall, efficiency standards increased by 25%, which is one of the most significant jumps that we've seen in some time. The state has set a goal for all residential buildings to be zero net energy by 2020, with commercial buildings phasing in by 2030. And these codes that are moving into place now are just a step toward that goal. So you might be thinking, if all of this is going on the list of what I have to do, why are we even talking about it? Although all projects have to meet the code standards, not everyone approaches projects in the same way. The choices you make as you develop, design, and build a project will determine how well the project can perform for you in the long term. For most developers, maximizing their financial benefits is an important project part of any project. I think one of the most common questions people ask is, well, how much will it cost me? Studies have been done to show that you can complete a LEED certified green building project for an average of only 2% more in upfront cost and sometimes less compared to standard market construction. These extra first costs can be recovered 
through increased market valuation, faster lease-ups, and rental premiums. Studies have also shown that including experienced green building professionals on your team and incorporating and integrating green features into your project at the earliest planning stages are keys to success. From the beginning, you'll need to decide what shade of green you want to be and begin making decisions. The choices you make at the start will have long-term consequences. They can affect the initial cost of the project, the utility costs for operations, tenant utility costs, and maintenance and replacement costs over the life of the property. How green will your building be? There are different ways to think of the answer to this question. First, you want to decide the overall goal you want your building to meet. Will it be LEED certified, silver, gold, platinum? Are you looking for net zero energy? Do you want to be just code compliant? Do you want reduced energy usage for your residents, for your common areas? Are you looking to get an award-winning design? So once you've decided that, you've started to set the parameters, and then you can begin to think about the building systems, the envelope, the HVAC system, the renewable energy system, the finishes, the amenities. Do you have goals for them? Are you thinking about performance, low maintenance? High tech. You want natural materials, low as first cost, low as life cycle cost, low as energy cost. If you're in a market where you can sell some of these features as amenities, the visibility and marketability will affect your decision making as well. I'm still waiting to meet somebody who thinks that HVAC systems are a sexy feature, but healthy buildings, natural materials for carpets and cabinetry, renewable power sources and lower electricity, recycled materials, and being able to back up some of your claims with certifications such as need are all selling features in more and more markets. Sadly, things don't come with nicely labeled options. You can't just pick a door to go through. However, the upside is sometimes you can pick more than one choice at a time. The key is to look at the choices and understand the consequences of what you are choosing. Let me give you an example of a choice you might make on a project and what the effect of it could be. If you decide to install a solar hot water system or tank with hot water system, both of these would provide you with energy savings. They each have a different long-term impact in terms of maintenance, lifespan, overall energy cost, and it may depend on whether you've set a goal of net zero energy how you've decided to recover your costs for water heating on that property, what your space needs are, how you plan to use your roof space. The upfront incentives for each one of these is quite different. So both of these things can meet the energy code requirements for efficient water feeding, probably within the budget that you've established. But each of them would have very different results for all of these other goals. One of the things to look at on a project isn't a building system at all, but relates more to the financing side of your project. Many people are tailoring their choice of energy efficiency measures to take maximum advantage of the tax credits that may be available. Of course, tax credits are an ever-changing market, but two of the most commonly used at this time are shown here. And of course, here's where I have to mention the automatic disclaimer that says, always go consult your tax advisor. The Energy Efficient Home Credit provides financial incentive for properties that choose to build more efficiently than a minimum standard. This is a federal tax credit, so the standard that they're comparing you to is the International Energy Code. If you work this out from the start with your design team, working closely with your energy engineers, you can align this requirement with the California codes and determine where you may need to make adjustments to meet this requirement and be able to compare the financial benefits, both from the tax credit and your efficiency savings, to what your construction cost increase related to the measures you are adding. You may find that these cost changes are not as significant as you might initially expect. The other credit, the solar investment tax credit, which is also sometimes referred to as the energy tax credit or the renewable energy tax credit, it's currently worth about 30% of your energy asset cost. This credit can be used for system installation both on new buildings 
and when you add a system onto an existing building. For this credit, you've got a much more straightforward analysis of what your benefits are since you're simply comparing a percentage of the cost of your system to the credit that you receive. Many owners use this to install solar or PV systems to reduce the electricity cost for the building's common area. However, as the cost of solar has come down, some owners are now looking at installing larger systems that provide a credit to tenant bills and using this to justify marginally higher rents in competitive markets. With the increasing cost of electricity, this may become a more attractive amenity for some. There's additional tax benefits that can come from things such as accelerated depreciation and community-based incentives that you may also be eligible for. Doing your research on these things before you start can definitely pay off. When a project's in a design phase, it's really easy to be tempted by some of the technology solutions that are out there. Building and system controls have come down in price, and equipment offers more options and features. There's a lot more systems available that can promise impressive energy savings. Only you know the strengths and expectations of your property managers and your maintenance staff. Do they keep up on training? Are they open to change and new ideas? If you were to take a walk through your existing properties, how likely would you be to find things set on manual and override settings? There's a lot of excellent systems that are available, both to manage and to monitor your systems and your energy. If you know what you'll use and invest at the level that's appropriate for your organization, you'll be happier with the results. By all means, go out and buy that course if you've got a staff that can appreciate it and keep it tuned for you. But if that's not the right choice, Stick to a good, reliable Chevy that'll keep running strong for years. Communication. With any project, the team needs to be clear in communicating the objectives from the start to avoid surprises and unmet expectations at the end. We all know the pitfalls of unspoken communication. You may think that everyone knows what you want, but it's better to spell it out and be sure about this particularly when it comes to the energy-related aspects of the project, material changes can be made during the design process that can affect performance, and you may not be aware of it until it's, until it's too late to undo the change. One example of this might be your building envelope design. High-performance windows could be specified by your design team to meet the energy performance criteria. Later in the process, as your budget's being reevaluated, something that we know rarely happens on any of our projects, a different team member might suggest an alternative window without realizing it didn't meet the same level of energy performance. If this wasn't realized until after the windows arrive on site or until they're installed, this could cause problems in meeting the building's overall energy performance goals. Expensive alternatives would have to be put into place to make up for this change. You can see that it's better that everyone on the team understand your goals from the start to avoid these unexpected surprises. So once you've decided what you want to include in the project, you want to be sure that what you asked for is actually built and performs as you expected. That's what this concept of building commissioning is all about. This is a requirement that's been around for a while now on commercial buildings and it's beginning to make its way into the multifamily and residential sectors. A commissioning agent should be a part of your team at the early stages so that they understand the intent of the design and can follow the process as the construction documents are developed. During construction, you can think of them as an owner's representative with the technical skills to ensure that those energy-related features you decided to put into the project will be installed and performed the way the design team expected them to. As systems get more complicated and have more interactions, this becomes an important role. A commissioning agent will perform functional tests on the energy systems of a building. As long as this requirement is clear to your construction team from the start, you won't see a lot of added costs, but you will have a higher level of assurance that all of the systems will work as designed particularly as the systems interact with each other. For years now, energy efficiency efforts have focused on electricity and gas savings 
and most of the code changes have targeted these areas as well. But water is an important component of sustainability. For one thing, more than 10% of the electricity used in California is used to move water. Even more water is used in large-scale energy generation. So saving water saves electricity, and saving electricity saves water. Water is also a shrinking resource, and we know that limited resources have a tendency to become more value, which translates into higher costs. For years, in many parts of the state, water has been relatively inexpensive, leading many people to believe that water efficiency wasn't a priority. California is moving into what many people say is a normal period of dryness, rather than a short-term drought. For those who have been paying attention to water efficiency, they are now ahead of the game. And for those who haven't, it's now time to catch up. Before we jump to these more dramatic solutions, like using gray water and black water systems for recycling water use, there's some much more basic things that can be considered at many properties. Well, we don't want to discourage people from things like shorter showers and fixing leaks and not leaving their faucets running. One of the biggest impacts you can make is to think hard about what you plant. As it says here, exterior air and water irrigation accounts for an average of 50% of the water use in low-rise multifamily properties. And often, it's nearly half of the utility cost paid by an owner as well. It's a lot of water and a big potential for savings. Whenever I mention the words drought tolerance, Many people have the immediate reaction that their properties need to maintain curb appeal, and they can't go around installing desert landscapes. They don't want to look like they're out in Palm Springs somewhere or worse yet in Las Vegas. What's important to remember is that what I now refer to as water-efficient landscapes can be colorful and lush, as you can see by these pictures here. Extensive use of ground covers, native grasses, and flowering plants can enhance your project's appearance and also significantly cut down on your maintenance costs compared to an open green lawn. Where you do need play areas for children, there's alternative materials you can use that are long-lasting, low-maintenance, and safer as well. With the newest restrictions that are coming out these days on water use, properties may soon be facing the prospect of brown dying lawns. These are definitely not an attractive feature. The incentives for replacement of existing grass and irrigation systems continue to rise, shortening the payback for this work even further. Your properties, with their water-efficient, colorful landscaping, may end up being the best-looking properties in the neighborhood. One area that many people overlook for water reduction is washing machines. If you have centralized laundry rooms, even if the supply and maintenance of these machines is outsourced, the utility costs are typically paid under the property by operating costs. Requiring vendors to supply energy efficient equipment will help you keep these costs down, both for the water and the energy to heat the water. If you've ever looked at the difference in energy use for washing machines in your own home, you know how much difference there can be between the least efficient and the most efficient machine. Why would you pay more than you need to on your property? One way to take this a step further is to consider encouraging cold water washing to reduce energy use. A study conducted by the Alliance to Save Energy showed that in locations where there was a price variation for cold, warm, and hot water washing, with the cheapest price offered for the cold water wash, energy use could be reduced by as much as 30%. You may be thinking that all of this is well and good, but I've got a lot of buildings in my portfolio that I built before all of these regulations came into place. So what do I do about those? Well, you'd be right to think about it. Energy and insurance are two of the biggest costs that most owners have in their budget that they cannot directly control. And when hit with a price increase, they often have to scramble to make up the difference with cost reductions elsewhere. Commercial electricity rates increased an average of more than 7% just from 2013 to 2014. Natural gas pricing has increased at about 5% per year, and these trends are expected to continue with no drop-off in sight. 
Of course, many of the things that we've been talking about can be applied to existing properties as well as your new construction. An additional tool to consider is benchmarking your portfolio's energy usage. Most people simply measure and track the monthly energy usage for each property using some type of a spreadsheet if they're tracking it at all. There are better tools available that will allow you to adjust for differences in property types, sizes, and weather, and provide reports and analysis so that the data becomes more useful and variations from the norm become more apparent. Benchmarking looks at energy use on a per square foot basis and allows you to make an apples to apples comparison. This is really important because an inefficient building can be as much as four times as costly as an efficient one. Many software systems also incorporate automatic retrieval of utility data, reducing the amount of work that goes into collecting this information every month. Once you know which properties are doing well, you can look more closely at your best practices and duplicate them at other properties. If properties are underperforming, you can focus your improvements on those properties to gain the greatest savings. Sudden changes in usage can be highlighted and addressed. An investment and bench benchmarking software can provide a better understanding from many perspectives. Once you have a better understanding of how much energy you're using, what can you do about it? An energy auditor can evaluate your property or your portfolio to let you know where your energy efficiency opportunities are. Depending on how similar your building types and systems are, you may find it, it's more effective to approach your projects on a systems basis across the portfolio. For example, replacing all of your hot water boilers with high efficiency boilers to gain economies of scale. Or you may choose to look at all the improvements at one property where your energy costs are noticeably higher than any other property. Completing an audit can help you get the information you need to make an informed decision. There are different levels of audit. The simplest ones will highlight straightforward opportunities, providing only general information on costs and savings. Deeper audits will explore your projects more thoroughly, providing more detailed information about costs and expected returns, often including information on possible utility rebates and incentives. These audits will cost a little more and take more time to complete in return for delivering more comprehensive information. I've listed some of the more common measures that are implemented for existing buildings. Depending on the age of your building, these are the things that will likely show the best return on investment. Some of them, like improving your HVAC units, can be incorporated into capital equipment replacement projects using the energy savings, maintenance savings, and possibly an incentive from the utility to justify the incremental cost increase for the unit. In some cases, you may find that you can replace the units slightly sooner than planned and begin collecting the savings in earlier years. Other projects, such as lighting retrofits and pump upgrades, typically have much shorter paybacks and a higher ROI with minimal upfront capital required. The challenge with these types of projects can be getting an owner's interest and attention to pursue the work. Often the best approach for these can be to look at a portfolio-wide solution so that you can maximize the returns once the project has been approved. One opportunity more and more people are starting to take advantage of is building retuning. This process is also sometimes called recommissioning or retrocommissioning. Some say that up to 20% of the energy used in commercial buildings is wasted because of improper operations. Building retuning provides a way to have an immediate impact, especially in the often overlooked small building market, which includes many multifamily buildings. Small buildings are considered as those that are under 100,000 square feet that frequently don't have any centralized building automation system. These buildings often have package units for their heating and cooling, and are controlled by zone thermostats. You can think of building retuning a lot like tuning up your car. It's a review of the building system to see that things are working as they should and making adjustments where things have gotten out of alignment. Depending on the complexity and age of a building, systems slowly move away 
from their optimum performance levels. Settings get adjusted, small leaks develop, systems get out of balance. Having a trained maintenance staff conduct a thorough review of building systems using formal checklists and procedures can provide the opportunity to get a building back to where it should be operating without any significant capital investment. I've provided a reference here to a website where you can find more resources on this topic if it's something you're interested in. The Department of Energy has developed a series of guidelines that are tailored towards small building retaining. Before you undertake any energy efficiency work, whether it's new or retrofit, you should contact your local utility company or check out their website. There are many rebates and incentives that are available to offset the cost of efficiency work. Some programs may offer you an audit to help evaluate potential projects. The programs vary and will change over time, so be sure to check back regularly. Some are based on specific equipment replacements, and other have, others have full building approaches that will provide an incentive based on the total savings achieved. It can be worth, the, worth your time to find, find out what's available, as some programs can cover a significant part of the incremental cost increase between standard equipment and more efficient equipment. There are also more programs developing all the time to help you pay for the improvements you may be considering. Two of the most recent developments in these financing programs are on-bill repayment and PACE. On-bill repayment allows you to borrow money for efficiency projects and repay it through your utility bill. The intent is that the savings achieved from the improvement will be put towards the payment, resulting in what's called bill neutrality. Essentially, you'll have no increase in your monthly bill payment. PACE is another alternative financing structure. Using approved lending programs, these loans are repaid through an annual assessment on the property tax bills. Pro I'm sorry, on the project's property tax bills. Proceeds of the loan can be used for any energy efficiency upgrades or for renewable energy installation. The approval process is designed to consider the savings achieved by the improvement as part of the loan repayment. Some mortgage lenders have also designed products to allow for additional borrowing capacity when a property is refinanced to encourage owners to incorporate energy efficiency projects into the property. Regardless of the financing structure, the estimate of your savings will be a key point of discussion with any lender. Typically, something less than 100% of estimated savings will be assumed for the potential repayment. So we've covered a lot of different subjects. We talked about the green market, why would you want to go green, how the codes are changing, the different aspects of green, things to consider when you're choosing improvements, some specifics on tax credits, the technologies you can look at, communication, commissioning, water efficiency, existing buildings, benchmarking, auditing, energy efficiency measures, building retuning, and incentives and financing. It's a pretty wide range of things to cover. And hopefully we've given you some new things to think about regarding green buildings. So I thank you for your time. We appreciate you attending our webinar. And we have some opportunities for questions for you. Thank you, Tamara. Just like she said, if you guys have any questions that you would like to ask her now is an opportune time to use the questions pane. We're going to leave a few minutes to answer any questions that come up. And while we're waiting for that, I'd just like to let you guys know a little bit more information that we touched base on in the beginning of the webinar. Family program. For multifamily property owners and managers like some, of the, some in our audience, the Energy Network Multifamily Program is a fantastic resource. It provides significant rebates and technical assistance to help you complete energy and water upgrades to your buildings. These incentives and energy upgrades are up to $1,200 per unit, and specific upgrades include windows, lighting, HVAC, appliances, water fixtures, and there's many more. 
Some benefits include lowering the operating costs, increasing property value, and improving, improving tenant retention. If you'd like more information, you can visit the website theenergynetwork.com or you, if you'd like to contact us for more information or if your property is in need of improvements, you can do that by dialing 949-264-2062. In addition, this webinar series, the sustainability series, is being co-sponsored by Greenpoint Rated, the leading green home certification system in California with more than 31,000 homes certified, including multifamily properties. Greenpoint Rated is a simple, affordable, and flexible rating system used by countless builders and developers. It assures residents that a building is healthier, more comfortable, durable, and resource efficient. The Greenpoint Rated team is comprised of leading green building experts, and they helped put together this webinar series and set the agenda for which sustainability topics are most relevant to multifamily developers and managers like yourself. By visiting buildagreen.org backslash Greenpoint Rated, you will find a multifamily checklist to see what kind of upgrades are factored into a Greenpoint Rated certification. And also, there are always educational events such as workshops, webinars, and trainings for you to learn more about energy and resource efficient upgrades. A few of our webinars that are upcoming will be this Tuesday, May 12th, is Passive House, Building a Re Ready Renewable, Renewable Ready California. You can register for this webinar by using this link or visiting builditgreen.org. Additionally, a little bit later up in the month, we have a webinar focused on water conservation in multifamily buildings. Again, you can use this link to register or visit builditgreen.org. I'd also like to let you guys know about a free workshop that is coming up in which David Myers, um, the director of the Southern, Calif Southern California program, will be speaking. Um, this event will be on May 20th from 9 to 10 a.m. That's a Wednesday, and it'll be at the Chimboli Cultural Center Joshua, Tree, Joshua Room. Um, the address is listed here. We highly encourage any multifamily property owners, managers to attend to learn more information about the Energy Network. The workshop is called Cost-Effective Improvements to Increase Your Property Value. If you do have any questions for the multifamily um, the Energy Network Multifamily Program in, in particular. Here's the contact information for David Myers, our Southern California Regional Director, and Jonathan Austin, our Multifamily Sales and Outreach Program Manager. I'll ask you that question right now. Okay. It is. Um, what energy tracking software systems have you had experience with, and what are your thoughts on those programs, on that software program? Sure. Um, we personally have used both Energy Scorecards and WeGoWise, and we found them both to be good programs. We liked both of them. We were intentionally testing them both to see if we thought one had any you know, distinct advantages or disadvantages. Um, in terms of what it could do, what its outputs were. Um, I think that what we found is that they, they both have certain strengths and weaknesses to them. And one of the key factors that you might want to look at when you're selecting a program like that is how well does the program work with the particular utility district that you are, um, your properties are in, and how well will it be able to download that information. Um, there are some other programs out there as well, and so I think that's a key question to be asking because one of the biggest challenges in benchmarking properties is the actual acquisition of the data, and the more automated that process can become, the less time and energy you'll have to spend on that aspect. Great. Thank you, Samara. And then it looks like we have another question, although this might be directed towards me, but um, do you happen to know how many multifamily homes have been LEED certified? Wow. Um, I don't know that anybody is necessarily tracking that separately because right. when we do multifamily, we use the LEED for Homes program. And mm -hmm. so I don't know that if I've ever seen USGBC put out separate statistics on the multifamily market itself. Yeah, I was, I was under the same impression for that one. 
Um, okay, great. It looks like we don't have any other questions at the moment. We will be hanging around for a few more minutes um, in case anyone wants to submit any last questions. I do want to give a very a big thank you to Samara for presenting such a great slide deck and great information. I've put up her, in, her contact information on the slide deck in front of you. That way, if you have any last minute questions or follow up questions you'd like to ask, feel free to give um, her an email, shoot her an email. And then if you have any questions regarding the Energy Network and the Multifamily Program, our contact information is also available. Um, as a follow-up, we will be sending out the slide deck to everyone and include a recording of this webinar as well. And that should be coming out either the end of the day, um, today, or tomorrow morning. Um, and with that, I would just like to say again, thank you everyone for attending today. We hope to see you at a future webinar. And Samara, thank you for your time and your expertise. You're welcome, and thank you all for coming as well. All right, everyone. Have a great afternoon.